There are so many cases in paleontology where scientists couldn't resist giving dinosaurs names that are a little unconventional. Sometimes it's a pop culture reference, sometimes it's a funny coincidence, and sometimes it's pure frustration. Take Dracorax hogwartsia, for example. Its skull looked so much like a mythical dragon that paleontologists named it after Hogwarts from the Harry Potter series. It literally means Dragon King of Hogwarts. And then there's Pantidraco caducus. Yes, you heard that right. The name comes from Pant e Ifnon, a fossil site in Wales, but to English speakers it sounds more like underwear dragon. Not intentionally, but definitely unforgettable. But out of all the oddly named dinosaurs, one stands out not just for its name, but for the story behind it. Meet Irritator Challengeri. It's not called Irritator because it had some annoying behavior or weird quirk in the wild. No, it earned that name because it genuinely irritated the scientists who studied it. From a falsified fossil to a frustrating reconstruction process, this Spinosaurid caused so much scientific grief that its name became a permanent record of that aggravation. And trust me, the story behind Irritator is just as wild as the name itself. This Spinosaurid lived around 113 to 110 million years ago, during the early Cretaceous, in what's now Brazil. Its fossil was discovered in the Romualdo Formation of the Araripe Basin, a place famous for incredibly well-preserved fossils. But here's where things get messy. The skull of Irritator was actually sold to a museum in Stuttgart by fossil dealers, and by the time paleontologists got their hands on it, it had been creatively edited. Think plaster added here, bits reshaped there, enough to make any scientist want to pull their hair out. So, when researchers officially named the species in 1996, they didn't hold back. The genus name Irritator literally came from how irritated they were with the whole situation, and the species name, Challengeri, is a shout out to Professor Challenger, the grumpy dinosaur hunting scientist from Arthur Conan Doyle's The Lost World. Fitting, right? But the story doesn't end there. Around the same time, another Spinosaurid snout from the same rock layer was named Angaturama limai. It's just the tip of the snout, but it raised eyebrows because it might actually belong to the same animal as Irritator. Some paleontologists think they're just different parts of the same dinosaur, while others are convinced. Without more overlapping bones, it's still up in the air. Despite the messy beginnings, Irritator is actually a big deal. The holotype, the one fossil we officially refer to, has the most complete Spinosaurid skull ever found. That's rare stuff. Thanks to that and some other bones found in the same area, a replica skeleton was made and put on display at the National Museum of Rio de Janeiro back in 2009. In terms of size, Irritator was on the smaller side for a Spinosaurid, about 6 to 8 meters long, that's roughly 20 to 26 feet, and weighing around a ton. It had a long, narrow snout full of straight, conical teeth, perfect for snagging slippery prey. A thin crest ran along the top of its head, probably for muscle attachment, and its nostrils were placed further back. Another hint, it may have spent a lot of time in the water. Add in a strong jaw reinforced by a secondary palate, and you've got an animal built to grab and hold onto struggling prey. Oh, and that other fossil, Langaturama? had this dramatic rosette at the tip of its snout and a tall crest. One possible skeleton even shows the classic Spinosaur sail and those oversized first finger claws we know and love. Irritator was originally thought to be a pterosaur, then someone thought maybe it was a Maniraptoran theropod, you know, one of those bird-like raptors. It wasn't until 1996 that it was finally confirmed as a Spinosaurid. A few years later, the skull got fully cleaned up and re-examined in 2002, locking in its identity. Scientists think Irritator probably had a diet kind of like a modern crocodile, mainly fish, but not too picky. It even swallowed a pterosaur at some point. Whether it hunted it or just found a free meal is up for debate. It likely lived in a warm, tropical coastal lagoon, sharing the environment with other theropods, turtles, crocodiliforms, and plenty of fish and flying reptiles. So yeah, Irritator Challengeri might have started off as a headache for scientists, 
but it turned out to be one of the most important windows we have into the lives of Spinosaurids. The holotype of Irritator Challengeri came out of Brazil's Araripe Basin, near the town of Santana do Cariri, wrapped in a chalky concretion. It was bought by fossil dealers and sent to a museum in Germany, where it was first mistaken for a giant pterosaur, a fair guess, since that region is packed with flying reptile fossils. But just before the paper went to print, reviewers flagged something odd. This wasn't a pterosaur, it was a theropod dinosaur. The fossil itself was a mess. The skull was squished, cracked, missing its snout tip, and worst of all, tampered with. Fossil traders had slapped on plaster or even glued parts together to make it look more impressive. Once CT scans exposed the damage, scientists realized how much had been faked or misinterpreted. One supposed head crest turned out to be a random bone fragment. Despite all that, this Frankenstein skull, named Irritator for the researcher's frustration, became the most complete Spinosaurid skull ever found. Its closest known relative at the time was Spinosaurus, based on shared features like long conical unserrated teeth. Even at its biggest, Irritator was kind of the runt of the Spinosaur family. Paleontologist Gregory Scott Paul pegged it at about 7.5 meters long and weighing around a ton, pretty lean by Spinosaur standards. Thomas Holtz gave it a little more credit, suggesting it could reach 8 meters and possibly tip the scales at over 3.5 tons. Others, like Dougal Dixon, were more conservative, guessing just 6 meters long and 2 meters tall, about the size of a big SUV. When researchers scaled up digital models, the holotype of Irritator Challengeri came in at around 6.5 meters, while the Angaturama holotype, a possible cousin or even the other half of the same animal, reached about 8.3 meters. That said, Irritator's skull bones weren't fully fused, so the holotype wasn't even fully grown. A separate skeleton represented a mid-sized spinosaur, and parts of it were used in the skeletal mount of the National Museum of Rio de Janeiro, which stands about 6 meters long and 2 meters tall. But there's a tibia fragment from another spinosaurid from the same formation, and if estimates are right, that creature stretched to about 10 meters long, and it was still growing. So while Irritator might not have been the biggest fish in the Cretaceous pond, some of its relatives were absolute monsters. So the main skull fossil of Irritator isn't perfect, but it's mostly there. It's missing the very tip of its snout and part of the lower jaw, but the rest gives us a pretty clear picture. The skull itself was about 60 centimeters long, around 2 feet, narrow and kind of triangular when you look at it from the front. Imagine a long, low snout with flat sides that slightly angle inward, like a sleek, prehistoric fishing spear. One of the wild things is where its nostrils sit, way back on the skull, which is a classic Spinosaurid trait. But Irritator's nostrils were smaller than some of its relatives, like Suchomimus and Baryonyx, but bigger than Spinosaurus. So, kind of a middle ground which might tell us something about its lifestyle or senses. There's this thin bony crest running along the top of its skull, made from its nasal bones, which probably wasn't just for show. Think of it like a flashy headband dinosaurs might have rocked to impress others. Unlike its cousin Spinosaurus, this crest didn't have big vertical ridges, but still gave the skull a distinctive profile. Inside the mouth, Irritator had something pretty special, a secondary palate which is a bony divider between its nose and mouth cavities. This is something you usually see in crocodiles, but not in most meat-eating dinosaurs. It probably helped it breathe while holding slippery prey in its jaws. Speaking of jaws and teeth, Irritator's teeth were straight or only slightly curved cones with sharp edges but no serrations. They had these neat lengthwise ridges called flutes on both sides, unlike some relatives that had flutes only on one side. The teeth were round in cross-section, not flat like most meat eaters, and had thin, wrinkly enamel. The biggest teeth up front were about 4 centimeters long, and they got smaller toward the back. Also, Irritator is one of the few non-bird dinosaur fossils found with a preserved stapes, a tiny ear bone. That's like finding a fossilized eardrum, 
super rare and helpful for understanding how these guys heard their watery world. Oh, and inside the jaw, new teeth were growing deep in the bone, ready to replace old ones. Kind of like how sharks keep regrowing their teeth. Pretty handy if you're snapping up slippery fish all day. So in short, Iritazor was this cool spinosaurid with a sleek skull, special nostril placement, a subtle but stylish crest, fish-friendly teeth, and even a crocodile-like palate, making it a specialized predator of its watery habitat. Pretty neat for a dinosaur with such a funny name, right? Back in the 90s, scientists guessed Irritator challengeri probably ate fish thanks to its long snout and sharp conical teeth without serrations. As I mentioned before, its skull wasn't just long and narrow, but also built tough, featuring a stiff secondary palate like crocodiles and nostrils set far back. This setup meant Irritator could keep breathing even when its jaws were underwater or full of prey. Plus, strong neck muscles hinted it could snap its jaws shut quickly against water resistance. Basically, a prehistoric fishing expert. But Irritator wasn't just about fish. Fossils show it likely had a varied diet, hunting or scavenging small dinosaurs, turtles, crocodile relatives, and even pterosaurs. In fact, one Irritator tooth was found embedded in a flying reptile's neck, showing it wasn't shy about tackling other prey types. This fits with the idea that Spinosaurids, including Irritator, were generalists, cruising coastal environments, grabbing whatever they could. Interestingly, a 2023 study showed that Irritator's lower jaw could rotate open sideways like a pelican's beak, allowing it to swallow surprisingly big meals. Its bite was fast, but relatively weak, so instead of crushing it likely relied on quick snaps and swallowing whole prey. Also, Irritator's nostrils were bigger and less pulled back compared to some of its relatives, suggesting it might have used smell more than others, who relied more on sight or snout sensors like crocodiles do. And much like the Indian gorilla, it sported a rosette-shaped cluster of interlocking teeth at the snout tip, perfect for impaling fish. In 2020, German paleontologist Marco Schad and his team took a deep dive into the Irritator holotype skull using CT scans, unlocking some cool insights about how this dinosaur might have behaved. They built a detailed 3D model of the skull and brain case, and found the Irritator had long olfactory tracks and surprisingly large focular recesses. That's the part of the brain connecting to the inner ear and helping control head and eye movements, especially when keeping your gaze steady while moving. An enlarged flocculus usually means an animal is quick with its head and body movements, and in Irritator, this matches up with other inner ear features like a big anterior semicircular canal. All this suggests it could whip its head around fast and held its snout angled downwards, giving a clear, forward-looking binocular vision, perfect for zeroing in on prey and snatching it precisely. It fits right in with what we'd expect from a fish-eating lifestyle. On top of that, Irritator probably had decent hearing, somewhere between birds and crocodiles, with an estimated hearing range from roughly 350 to 3550 hertz. Not super sharp, but enough to catch the important sounds in its environment. Irritator and its close relative Angotorama came from the Romualdo Formation in Brazil, which dates back to the Albion stage of the early Cretaceous, so we're talking about roughly 110 million years ago. This was a wild time when the South Atlantic Ocean was just starting to open up, carving out the coastal basins of southern Brazil and southwestern Africa. But interestingly, northeastern Brazil and parts of West Africa were still connected back then, which probably influenced how animals like Irritator spread around. The Romualdo Formation itself is part of the Santana Group, though back when Irritator was first described, it was lumped into what was then called the Santana Formation. What makes Romualdo really special is that it's a Lagerschatter, basically a fossil hotspot where the preservation is crazy good. Fossils are trapped in limestone concretions inside shales, which means you get incredibly detailed 3D fossils, not just flattened impressions. 
This place is famous for pterosaur fossils, but also preserves soft tissues like muscle fibers and even internal organs of fish, gills, digestive tracts, hearts, you name it. The environment back then was basically a coastal lagoon with a mix of fresh and saltwater influence, shifting with rising and falling sea levels. The climate was tropical, pretty similar to modern Brazil, but the surrounding land was more on the dry side, arid to semi-arid, with plants adapted to those dry conditions. Cycads and an extinct conifer called Brachyphyllum were the dominant plants. This setting was a playground for tons of flying reptiles. Pterosaurs like Anhanguera, Tapiyara, and many others were all over the skies. And on land, aside from Irritator, there were other theropods too. A tyrannosaurid named Santanaraptor, the small Compsonathid Mauritia, and a Megaraptoran. Crocodiliforms like Araripisuchus and Caririsuchus patrolled the waters and turtles like Brasilemis and Santana Kellis hung around as well. The lagoon was also full of invertebrates, clam shrimps, sea urchins, mollusks, and a variety of fish, including sharks, gars, and other ancient fish families. Interestingly, there's a notable lack of herbivorous dinosaurs in the Romualdo fauna. Paleontologists think this might mean the plant life was too sparse to support large populations of plant eaters, so carnivores like Irritator probably focused more on the rich aquatic food supply. Plus, after storms, dead fish and pterosaurs would wash up on shore, giving these predators plenty of carrion to feed on. With so many fish eaters around, there had to be some sort of food sharing or niche splitting. Different species likely specialized in hunting prey of different sizes or living in slightly different parts of the lagoon. The animals found in the Romualdo Formation share some similarities with those in the nearby Crato Formation, and even with Middle Cretaceous African fossils. This suggests the Araripe Basin was connected, at least occasionally, to the Tethys Sea. However, the lack of marine invertebrates shows this was mostly a non-marine environment, more of a coastal lagoon than an open sea. Spinosaurids, including Irritator, were already spreading worldwide in the early Cretaceous. Studies suggest Spinosaurines evolved in Gondwana, while their relatives, Baryonychines, lived up north in Laurasia. Later, Spinosaurines likely made their way into South America from Africa as their continents drifted apart. As the South Atlantic Ocean grew, African and South American Spinosaurines evolved separately, showing some differences like the ones seen with Oxalia from Brazil's Alcantara Formation. But the full story of Spinosaurid evolution is still unclear. Finds in Asia and Australia hint their spread was more complex than we thought.